conferences. <laughs> so thank you very much for inviting me here. It's a, it's, it's, I'm really excited to be here. I'm really excited to meet all of you to show you some of what we've been doing over the past few years um, to learn more about what's going on here and see some of the great new facilities later on. Um, actually, I have a little story about that Department of Commerce Committee. I'm not serving on that committee anymore because it was one of the first that was, um, was one of the first that was, uh, uh, what do you, how do you say, canceled or eliminated. It was one of the first advisory committees that was eliminated by our current administration. <laughs> so um, there you go. But I'm currently serving on too many committees. Um, anyway. Uh, okay, so I'm here today to talk to you about our Lab on CMOS biosensors work. Um, there's a picture there, but we'll just get into what that means. Okay, um, this is really starting from lab on a, the, the area of lab on a chip. So the kind of the, the starting point for this work is lab on a chip, um, which is work that's developed over the last couple of decades. Um, there are a lot of people who've worked in this area. It's a very um, important and growing research area, and um, it's, resulted, it's resulting in a lot of um, commercialized devices and assays and, and changes in healthcare system. Um, lab on a chip systems are devices that integrate multiple laboratory functions onto a single chip. Um, the motivation is that is the systems are, are small, they're in the range of millimeters to centimeters. Um, they can carry out analyses like bioassays much faster um, with much smaller volumes and much less use of reagents and use of sample sizes um, than traditional systems. Um, the other, one of the other um, appealing factors about a lab on a chip system is that they are known for automation. So rather than having you know, trained technicians in a laboratory taking a sample from one machine to another, if you're integrating those machines into a microsystem, then you no longer have need for some of those trained technicians and you can carry out a lot more automation in, um, in chemical and biochemical analysis systems. So now, do I do that? No, I do that. Okay, okay. So. Um, the reality of lab on chip systems, though, is that by and large, they are chips inside labs, <laughs> okay? Um, mostly, you get these tiny millimeter to centimeter scale chips that are connected to a whole bunch of equipment, right? So this is showing you that, you know, it's not just this little tiny millimeter or inch scale chip that you care about, but in order to run that inch scale, centimeter scale chip, you've got massive input and output, a microscope, you've got all kinds of instrumentation. And so there's a whole lot of machinery and equipment outside of the, outside of the frame of the, you know, outside of the field of the picture. So mostly these um, labs on chip are chips in labs. Okay. Um, the reality part two is that labs on chips use chips that are passive substrates. So it's really chip lab on glass, <laughs> okay? Um, and, and it's kind of stretching what at least we think of as chips. If you're, you're this is an electrical and systems engineering department, right? I'm a chip, de I'm a chip designer, Ch Shantan is a chip designer, we love chips. Chips can do amazing things. But when we say lab on chip, mostly that's really not what people are talking about. So mostly the only active part in most lab on chip systems is the chemistry. So what's active and what's interesting is that miniaturization of the chemistry in the chemical reactors. Um, but by and large, there's no sensing or instrumentation. All of that is mostly carried out externally. So there are no real chips involved. Um, so a lot of the work that I've done in my career has been working towards leveraging Moore's law for biosensing. Um, most integrated circuits are based on CMOS. Um, CMOS is cheap. Low power, fast, um, it allows integration of all kinds of important things, um, sensing, readout, control, signal processing, um, data conversion, communications. Um, CMOS ICs in these kinds of systems, there's a huge opportunity for CMOS ICs to replace that bulky benchtop equipment and support further miniaturization and integration of that of, of, of the, the system to make real devices that can be really fieldable. Um, so CMOS is mostly compatible with um, standard microfabrication techniques. So there's a huge opportunity here for taking CMOS devices, CMOS sensors, CMOS signal processing and control chips, and putting them in intimate contact with 
this huge field of lab on chip systems that you know is there and is mature and is very important. Okay, there are a couple of different ways. So this is one way you can think about different kinds of lab on chip hybrid IC systems. Um, you can think about um, systems that have a multi chip solution. Um, versus ch systems that have a single chip solution. So I just want to kind of point this out because there are a whole lot of systems where you, you don't need to put things directly on the CMOS chip. That takes a lot more time, effort, energy, cost. Um, you only do this when there's a good reason to do it. Okay, I'm going to focus most of this talk on lab on CMOS, but for the most, you know, for the most part, most systems, and more, there are more mature examples of systems that have a multi-chip solution, where you separate the sensing surface and the sensing sites from your instrumentation, your signal processing, whatever it is you're using the chips for. Okay, and so this, this kind of solution can still be miniaturized, it can still be portable, it can still be handheld, you can still call it lab on chip. Um, when we start putting those functions together into more intimate contact so that you actually have the sensing directly with the CMOS integrated circuits, we, t we call that lab on CMOS. Okay. Um, okay, so just a little bit about multi-chip systems because they're really important. Um, the biofluid interface, so there's some, a, a lot of very significant advantages. Your biofluid interface, your sensing interface, and your IC can be developed separately and independently using well-established methods. That's a big bonus. Um, there are many successful examples of these kinds of systems. Most of the kinds of systems that we use for neural interfaces or electrochemical sensing, I think Shantanu's done some of this electrochemical sensing work and getting closer to the neural interface work, as I hear. Um, but a lot of these successful examples of these kinds of systems are these multi-chip solutions. Okay, um, the size of the IC is just defined by what you need to put on it and not any constraints from the sensing. Um, there's no inherent limit on how big that passive interface chip needs to be because it's mostly glass. Um, you get reduced complexity and cost, and your, um, so, so this is where you get into the drawbacks. The density of your sensing then is inherently limited by your input-output connections. You have to be able to connect into that sensing array, that sensing um, area, in order to actually carry out your, your readout, your instrumentation, your sensing. Okay. And so, Typically, not strictly, but typically there'd be a one-to-one -one mapping between your sensing sites and your ability to access that in your instrumentation. Um, and it also, because, because there's some distance there, there, it presents a greater opportunity for the signals to be corrupted by noise as they get from the sensing array into your electronics. So was there a question? Okay. Okay, so this is what I'm mostly going to focus on, is these single-chip bioIC systems, okay? They bring in a huge number of challenges in heterogeneous integration, okay? It's really difficult to do this, but I, I hope to show you by the end of the talk that there's some promising applications that are enabled by being able to do this. Um, on the other hand, um, noise and parasitics can, so if what you're trying to measure is truly a very weak signal, um, noise and parasitics can overwhelm that weak signal, so you want to put the sensing right with the sensor sites. Um, some sensing techniques require, inherently require the presence and the operation of active circuits. Okay, for example, a good example of this is active pixel sensors that everyone has in their, in their cell phone. Um, some applications inherently require a small size or footprint. If you want to access certain kinds of physical ph phenomena, you simply have to be able to access that, that, that scale. Um, some applications can accommodate wires. Similarly, a lot of bio applications, wires are very problematic. Um, and tight coupling between CMOS and sensing offers the opportunity for additional functionality. Um, for example, if you're doing this with a, with a spike detecting array, you can actually directly on the spike detecting array have additional processing where you're detecting the spikes instead of communicating, you need, wasting lots of bandwidth and power by communicating waveform channels in order to have some off-chip circuit or off-chip system detect your spikes, you can just directly detect spikes at the front end. That allows you to have reduced communication bandwidth. Um, you could also, um, uh, implement control circuits for localized electrochemical actuation or detection. Um, sometimes in electrochemical systems, it's, it, it's exceedingly important to have local control, right? To have that local potentiostat feedback to keep the system in the place where the measurement needs to be kept. Okay. Um, additionally, 
when we introduce CMOS into a system like this, we allow for significantly increased density of sensing sites because now we have the opportunity to provide switches and to have, um, to have more than a one-to-one -one mapping between sensing sites and uh, readout capability. Okay, so there's actually a surprisingly long history for Lab on CMOS. Um, S silicon, uh, you know, anyone who's, who's, who's taken a basic um, semiconductor materials class, electronic materials class, knows that silicon is sensitive to all kinds of different physical variables. So therefore, there are many, many different kinds of silicon sensors that are available, photodiodes, CCDs, pressure sensors, temperature, accelerometers, hall plates, ISFETs. Right? So there's all kinds of sensing that we can do directly in silicon. Um, the first sensor that I've been able to identify that was in integrated with an active device was a Hall device in 1968, okay? That's before I was born even, and I'm one of the old people in the room, <laughs> okay? Um, ISFETs were similarly um, one of the very first examples of these, um, uh, sorry, of these um, integrated sensors directly integrated with the active readout. Um, and they were um, introduced again in 1968. So there's been this very long history of things that we weren't, just, we weren't necessarily thinking of them as lab on, lab on CMOS, but they were. Um, Andrew Mason, one of our colleagues in this field who was at Michigan State, who I think Shantanu knows, um, coined the term lab on CMOS back in a paper. The first instance I found of it was in 2011. But we've been doing it for approximately you know, 50 years between now and then. Okay, um, I'm taking too long with this, but I wanted to just show you, so I don't wanna go into the details of this. If you wanna see these slides later, I'll, I'll be happy to provide them, but I just wanted to show you some kind of overview of, diff of, of work that is there. Where are we in this field of lab on CMOS? It's actually considerably more mature than you might realize. Um, so this is uh, summarizing a number of um, lab on CMOS systems that were designed for physical measurements. So from temperature to mass sensing to um, to wind pressure to um, NMR. Um, this is a bunch of electrical measurements that I thought were worthwhile to bring out. And this is going back to, you know, 2003. Some of these works are quite mature. I was trying to kind of pick out the seminal work in each of these areas. Um, so microelectrode arrays, cell manipulation via electrical mechanisms, cell manipulation via magnetic mechanisms, um, and um, this was an example of a microelectrode array with capability both for stimulation and recording. Okay, um, here's, a, a, here's a number of optical lab on CMOS systems um, for cell detection, um, basically just imaging a cell culture, um, various, um, various contributions in fluorescence, either time-resolved fluorescence or fluorescence lifetime or FRET or just detecting DNA spots. Um, here's a, a summary of electrochemical detection. So there's, this was uh, one of the earliest electrochemical detectors I found. This was electric, combining electrochemical with microfluidics. Uh, this was um, amperometry using carbon nanofibers. Um, this is ion imaging back to some of that um, ISFET work. So this, th this group is known for doing these large ISFET arrays these days. Um, and this is some of what you'll see later on. Um, this, this is a summary of some capacitive lab on CMOS systems for cell detection or DNA detection or detecting cell health or detecting bacterial growth. And this is the last slide. Sorry to kind of drag you through that, but I just want you to get the sense. It's not important to look at the individual papers here. I'll be happy to provide these slides if you care about it. But what's important is to get this sense that this is really actually, there's been a lot that's gone on. People have shown some really fantastic things and it's a maturing field. Um, so this, these are some gas plus fluidic contributions, both in detecting gas and performing gas chromatography in a lab on CMOS system, or in um, um, investigating membrane proteins in lab on CMOS systems. Okay. Okay, so that's a, just to show you, there's, there's a lot there. It's an exciting field. There's lots left to do. Why is it hard? I think that from my perspective, one of the hardest things about, the, about um, lab on CMOS work is that you've just got very different requirements between biological systems and ICs. It's the, the, the requirements for those two worlds is, couldn't be more different. Um, there are a lot of technical challenges in 
the, 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 the capabilities, our capabilities for multi-domain modeling in lab on CMOS systems is very, very primitive, if not non-existent. Um, electrothermal effects can often be very significant. Signal coupling through fluid is something that will really bite you if you don't watch it. The dielectric constant of water, who's got it? What's the dielectric constant of water? Come on, there's a bunch of students here. Shantanu? <laughs> The constant of water is 80. That is huge for signal coupling, right? The dielectric water is going to couple that signal through really, really well. So you have to be careful about these things. Okay, um, electrochemical effects. You'll see some examples of in some pretty pictures later on. Um, floor, it increases the complexity of floor planning and packaging is, a, is an ever-present problem. Um, I think that maybe, I think that there's some hope, I've seen some recent papers, there's some hope that maybe in the next few years we'll be able to take advantage of more industrial standard packaging approaches to be able to solve some of these packaging issues. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna show you some work that we've done specifically for a couple of applications, one for olfactory sensing and another for cell viability monitoring. Okay, um, and so this is just to kind of show you some of the pretty pictures of why CMOS and biology don't match together, right? CMOS likes to, likes to be dry, likes to be electrically isolated. Biology, in order to stay alive, needs to be wet, okay, needs to be kept at certain temperature, as Shantanu has learned, needs to be in a certain pH, needs to be in an aseptic environment. So there are all kinds of constraints here that don't, aren't necessarily compatible. So when you put CMOS into wet environments, this is one of my favorite pictures. It's from very early work we did with packaging CMOS chips. And what do you see? You see these glorious electrochemical reactions that have happened because the water was transported into that um, that PDMS, it's, actually this is not PDMS, this is an RTV, this is another kind of encapsulant. But, I mean, you see that you get these spectacular failures, <laughs> okay? I've spent 20 years having these spectacular failures. <laughs> um, if I press this, um, you also can see what happens when biology dries out, okay? If you let the medium evaporate, if the biology gets cold, what you see is that the cells don't like it. They shrivel up and die. So that's a picture of cells slowly shriveling up and dying over 12 hours. They're gasping out their death spasms. Ah, okay. So, um, okay. CMOS constraints, uh, the kinds of things that we need to take into account for CMOS are things like packaging, selecting materials, physical design, post-processing, how do you do the fab, um, energy and power become significant, how do you get the signals in and out. In biology, we need to know how the fluids are getting in and out. We need to take care of these electrochemical effects because they are very significant. We need to ensure biocompatibility. We need to have good environmental control. We need to make sure the surface treatments are adequate for what we want to do with them. If we're growing cells on them, you have to have certain kinds of surface treatments and we need to be able to optically assess what's going on. Um, and when we start putting those together, our, we, it, we really have kind of, it's, it's the Wild West. We have no capability really for any consistent modeling and design. Um, there are very few models. Model validation is very problematic. There's enormous stochasticity and variability. I would say that this field is, you know, where MEMS was 20 years ago. Um, there are no, no concept of anything such as DRC rules, how you could make something and ensure that it works. Um, there's always unanticipated physical interaction, and there, the simulation tools for being able to handle this are incredibly primitive. Like, literally in my lab, we spend a lot of time beating our heads against COMSOL and ANSYS, and they're just very inadequate simulation tools for the kinds of problems we're trying to solve. Okay. Um, okay, so, so this slide is about electrochemical effects. Um, fluidic and cell culture environments are inherently electrochemical spaces. CMOS chips are not inherently electrochemical, they're inherently electrical. And so um, one of the challenges of putting CMOS together with electrochemical spaces is that, uh, you know, there are all kinds of, like you can learn them, they're fine, but you have to un understand that electrode potentials vary over time. Um, you, can, you can, and I have, found unintentional interactions between electrostatic discharge circuits that are intended to protect your circuit and the DC potentials that happen because of electrochemical effects in a, in a system. Okay, that can be a very tricky one to sort out. Um, you can have saturation of inputs just because your electrode potentials are wandering around in electrochemical space. Um, you know, people will say, oh yeah, you can just put an electrochemical reference electrode there. 
But what they don't tell you is the electrochemical reference electrodes in a microfabricated world don't. You can get them to work for one experiment or one day or one hour, but they're generally very problematic and they don't last. Okay. Okay, so we've done a fair amount of work in bio-IC packaging. Um, the basic idea is that you have a chip. Maybe you put the chip in something so that you can handle it because the chips that you get back from a foundry are somewhere between one and, you know, one millimeter and one centimeter. Um, and then some, and some part of the chip you want active sensing and you want to have that part of that, the sensing, the active sensing part of that chip exposed and then you've got other things, wires, con electrical connections that you want to not be exposed. Okay, it's very challenging because in early stage research we're often not working with full wafer runs. I've, have you, how often do you do full wafer runs, Shantanu? Yeah, I've never done a full wafer run in my career. <laughs> um, we work with prototyping runs, we get back a few parts, and we need to take those few parts and make them into something that works. Um, handling these tiny die is really, really problematic. If I worked with a whole wafer, people say, why don't you just work with a whole wafer? Well, we, it's, 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 it's prohibitive for early stage research, for pr exploratory research. If you have a whole wafer, the edge bead at the edge of the die is a small fraction of the total, so you can actually accommodate that. If you work with a tiny die, the edge bead takes up half of your space, okay? And you can't do any real patterning or processing in many cases just because of, you know, the, the, the surface tension of the materials that you work with. So these are very problematic issues. There, 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 there are ways around this, right? You can, you can deal with edge bead, but it's problematic. Um, microfluidics is another is another issue. Um, liquid volumes are small, but in order to get those liquids in and out requires an awful lot of infrastructure. Um, microfluidic systems are usually centimeter scale devices and they usually have specific requirements for things that are hydrophilic or bondable or biocompatible or with very specific surface functionalization. Okay, so this was, these are some figures from a, a, a paper we put together a number of years ago that just, um, kind of summarize the main approaches for packaging in lab on CMOS systems. You have some people who've just used really big chips. If you make the chips big enough, then you solve the problems because your connections are far enough apart, it's not an issue. Um, if you have wire bonds, that's, that's a problem. That, that is one way to solve it though. You just, you just put your chip in there, wire it up, and then find a way to encapsulate your wire bonds. Um, I recall that the graduate lab that I came out of had a very specific um, procedure for encapsulating wire bonds at one point in time, which involved, I think it was magic number nine pur purple fingernail polish. <laughs> I mean, so some of these are, you know, they've been there and some of them work and then they don't work very well. Um, there are some, some people have shown via approaches where you drill holes down through the chip and make connection that way. Um, what we've found and what other labs that we, that we know in this field have worked with primarily are um, chip and hole, or, or we, we, we refer them to, to them affectionately as pucking approaches, where you basically take your wafer and you embed it in a big puck. Um, the two main approaches that we still work with today in my lab are the wire bonded approach and encapsulating wire bonds and um, pucking, or chip and hole. Okay, so now I get to show you some of the things that we've done with lab on CMOS systems. Um, okay, so the two uh, applications I'm going to talk to you about are olfactory sensing and cell viability monitoring. So first, nose on a chip, okay? Um, why do we want to do nose on a chip? Every time that you find a high value olfactory sensing application, you find a dog in the loop. Okay, we love dogs. My kids just got a dog, okay? Dogs are fantastic. I have no gripe about dogs, but dogs are very inconvenient as a primary sensing transducer, right? <laughs> Seriously, in the state of olfactory applications, every time you have an olfactory application that you really care about, there's a dog there, okay? The dog is still, to this day, our primary transducer for olfaction, which is crazy. Okay, um, dogs are problematic because they're expensive, they're troublesome, you can't just have a dog, you have to have the dog and the handler, and there's a whole infrastructure built up around that. Okay, so the, the goal here is why can't we take the same transduction machinery that dogs use, i.e. the olfactory sensory neurons, and use those as the basis for an olfactory detector. So um, 
we've been working on this for a lot of years. Okay, I've, got, I've cut to the chase here. I've shown you we can do this. Okay, you can do this. You can take those cells. You can put them on a microelectrode array. You can monitor, the, monitor their spiking activity. Um, so this, this is some, uh, these are results from a paper from a few years ago that shows if, if we, um, the properties of these cells is that they respond to a particular odory motif. Um, they respond to one particular um, odorant. And so in order to test those cells, we had exposed the different, um, we'd, we'd exposed all of the cells really to um, different mixes. Each of the mixes was a mix of three different odorants. Um, but really, if you go back and you look at the, this is going back to this cell and looking at this mix two, and then instead of presenting all three at the same time, you split it out into the first, the second, and the third component of the mix, you see it's really only responding to the, the second component of mix two. And this cell was really only responding to the third component of mix three. Okay, so let me show you some, some of what's beyond, behind that, right? I, the, the status of this work, which you, I hope you'll agree with me when you see some of the, 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 the details, is that we've demonstrated proof of concept. There's still a lot of work to be done. We need to study this with different odors. We need to understand titration. What is the limit of detection? Um, we're currently working with a group in Japan to develop this with more robust cells. Um, we haven't handled any of the practical engineering details like dealing with the air to water interface or the local, we've, we've started on the local signal processing. Okay, um, so dogs are still the gold standard. Rats are pretty good too. Um, each dog takes $100,000 to $150,000 to train and requires a skilled handler. Um, rats happen to have more olfactory range than dogs. They have, more, they have a, a larger genetic repertoire for olfactory receptors. Um, but I think if you're in the space of dogs or rats or mice, you're still pretty good. Um, the technical approach here is to use the same sensors as rats, um, monitor electrical activity of the primary olfactory sensory neurons and correlate that activity across distinct m multiple um, kinds of olfactory sensors. Yeah, question. So the cells that you showed in the last slide, they are uh, associated sensory neurons from the rat olfactory? So we worked for a long time. We worked, so when we worked on this project, we worked initially with the wrong collaborator who we would, was one, it was someone who had shown in the literature that they had immortalized olfactory sensory neurons. So we said, oh, great person to work with. Um, but they, they were not an electrophysiology lab, so they kept giving us cells that were alive but not electrically active. So for a neuron, there's a big difference between being alive and being electrically active. Um, so we never actually got the prep to work with rats or mice or dogs. We'd never tried with dog cells. So we never got the prep to work with rats or mice cells. What I'll show you next is, okay, give, give me two slides. Okay, um, so biological, um, bi in, in the real nose, Olfactory sensory neurons live in the olfactory epithelium. They put their cilia out in the mucus of the nose. That's where the odorants are. And then those axons of the primary olfactory sensory neuron project directly into the brain. Okay? And so this is, this is really what we want to harness. Um, these primary olfactory sensory neurons directly make spikes. They bind an odor and they make spikes. Okay, and so I think it's a, it's a fantastic opportunity for us to develop olfactory sensors that can, that have responses built in to lots of odorants that we care about already, right? Evolution has been, has already done the work for us. There are, I think, 800 olfactory receptor genes in dogs, about 11, 1200 in rats, in humans about 300. Um, so let's just use that space. There's a lot of psychophysical literature that demonstrates that um, humans can tell a lot about other humans that we don't necessarily think about. There, humans can detect major histocompatibility complex like personal identity, um, fear in other humans. There's an awful lot that even humans, we don't think of ourselves as olfactory creatures, but even humans can do quite a lot of sophisticated olfactory sensing. Okay, so now. We didn't get it to work with rats or mice, but we did get it to work with um, salamanders. So the salamanders were simply much easier. They let us get the prep work to work. I don't think that, I think that we could get it to work with mice. We just haven't. Um, sal the, 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 the difference between the salamander cells and the mice cells 
is mouse cells is that um, the salamander cells, we could put them in a fridge and leave them there. And the mouse cells were just a lot trickier in terms of handling them, keeping them warm, making them happy. So the, the olfactory sensory neurons are probably the trickiest cells that we've worked with over many years in any of these systems. Um, so ultimately, we got it to work with salamander OSNs. We had cells that were harvested and dissociated directly from the olfactory epithelium of salamanders. Um, we cultured them on microelectrode arrays. Now, one thing, if you've done any cell culture, if you've done any of this kind of work, you will look at this picture and you'll say, oh my god, that looks really awful. Okay, the truth is that olfactory, you know, the olfactory epithelium is not a sterile system. So you're never going to get a sterile culture, except from um, immortalized cell lines, you're never going to get a sterile culture of primary harvested olfactory sensory neurons. You're just not because they don't live in a sterile environment. And so um, anyone that does do cell culture will look at that and think that I've got a pretty skank lab going on, but um, <laughs> it's just because that's the nature of this culture. Okay, um, so our exper experimental setup was that we had this, um, we had the, the, the lab on CMOS in the puck with its, with a, 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 a sorry, a wire redistribution framework to be able to get the wires out to the edge where we could make connection to them. Um, so we um, arranged that microelectrode array in a perfusion system with um, stimulants coming in and, and then flowing out the other side. We cultured OSN cells on the array and then exposed cells to stimulants in the fluid in alternation with blank medium and then with positive controls. Okay, and the, the upshot is we can do this. Okay, we can do this, it was repeatable, um, it was stable, the signals are really strong. Um, so this was for a couple of channels. Um, you know, you see the, the experimental sequence, which is that we applied a mix, we flushed, we applied another mix, we flushed, and so on. Um, potassium chloride is a positive control that just in shows you for sure that those are neurons. And so this is the positive control to say, yes, there's a neuron on that electrode. Um, and this was another channel where instead of responding to mix three, we responded to mix two. And then you can go back into the, comp the constituent components of that mix and then determine which of those um, stimulants the, the individual cells were, act the individual cell, the individual single cell was actually responding to. <coughs> okay. This is where we got to before we ran out of money, <laughs> okay? We had consistent reproducible results. If a cell was responsive to one thing and then we looked into within the mix to see what within the mix it was responsive to, it was responsive to that same thing over many days in culture, okay? This is as far as we got. We got up to about four days. Yeah? So this was in a, in a controlled setting and you could backtrack to um, what actual chemicals you were doing the electric response to, but have you done Yeah, that, that's a great question. This is a calibration curve, right? I mean, you could do it in a couple of different ways. If you have the infrastructure of having immortalized and immortalized cell lines that have well-defined properties and they're expressing stable receptors through multiple generations, you could do this by simply saying, oh, okay, I'm gonna take that cell and put it there. Um, if you don't have that, that's an infrastructure that we are working on but we currently don't have yet. Um, then what you can do, there, there are about two or three labs in the world that have reported immortalization of olfactory sensory neurons. We worked with one of those labs and they could never wake up their cells. So we currently don't have that infrastructure. Um, the second option is that you do exactly what we just did and what I showed you and you consider that to be a calibration curve. So um, it does put some limitations onto how you can use it and how long you can use it and how you'd have to transport it between point A and point B. All fair questions. But they are like distinct signals. They're distinct signals and they're stable and reproducible. That was the point. Before we did this, we didn't know if we could apply more than one signal, right? Like, can you, if, once you apply the one signal to those cells and culture, since they're kind of in a stressed environment, they're not in their original environment, are they going to respond to the second thing you, you, you shoot at them? You, but, but we've shown, yes, you can do that. They respond, it's reproducible, and it's consistent. <clears throat> okay. Um, okay, so now for something completely different. Okay, so that was the nose on a chip story. 
I think it's a promising proof of concept. It needs, it needs some additional light of day and funds to make it go forward. <laughs> um, cell capacitance sensor is another one that we've done more work on more recently. Um, the, this was a concept that we had about 15 years ago, a little, maybe a little more than 15 years ago. We thought, if you talk to a cell biologist about what they, how they study cells, and if you just say, what do you need to know about the cells that you're studying? They, ba they will usually tell you we look at them to see if they're healthy. We do, we, do, we do nasty things to them, and then we look at them to see if they're healthy. And okay, well, what does a healthy cell look like? A healthy cell looks like these. A healthy cell looks like it's plastered on a surface, okay, at least for Anchorage-dependent cells, okay? Unhealthy cells release from the surface and ball up, and they do what I showed you in the video earlier. They, they detach from the surface, they ball up, they die. Um, so most kinds of cells that we use in the context of cell culture are what we call Anchorage dependent, which means that they grow on a solid substrate and they need that solid substrate for growth. Attachment to that substrate and coupling with that substrate is a very sensitive indicator of cell morphology and cell viability. And we've taken advantage of that by making capacitance sensors to directly measure that, cu that's, that coupling, okay? Um, yeah, so unhealthy, unhealthy cells adhere weakly and present low capacitance. Healthy cells adhere strongly and present high capacitance. Okay, um, we've gone through a few generations of this device. I won't drag you through all the generations. This is the one we use now. Um, it's a very, very, very simple circuit. Anyone who's taken first year circuits has seen this circuit. It's a, it's a very simple technique based on a ring oscillator. We are simply using an interdigitated electrode on which we grow the cells to load the ring oscillator. The frequency of oscillation of the ring oscillator shifts and we're able to detect the shift in capacitance by counting the oscillation, by counting the cycles of oscillation. It's very simple, but it's effective. Um, it's very easy for us to produce a digital output. We tried for a long time with, an anal with analog versions of this, of this sensor. We were working with some, um, some, some labs overseas who wanted to use these um, devices to measure cell responses to like nanoparticle toxicity and whatnot. Um, the, they couldn't ever get our devices to work. Okay, we would give them the devices, we would have, endless, they would come and stay with us for a couple weeks, we'd go visit them, we'd have endless um, Skype calls, it never worked. They could never get things to work. When we made it into a digital sensor, it worked. <laughs> I think this is the power of systems integration. Okay, for us in the sensor, the readout is con converted to digital bits simply by counting. We don't need an additional ADC. Um, the resolution is, is limited by how long you want to wait. Okay, so the system design concept here is that we're minimizing wiring requirements. We, so we've put in this array of um, capacitance sensors, so now we have a capacitance imager across our chip, and we have some control logic that provides an I2C interface to a microcontroller. So now this capacitance array is a microcontroller peripheral. We don't have any external control that's required, everything is internal. It's, relatively low power, and it's really designed directly, we, we literally directly use this as plug and play with commercial microcontrollers. Okay, so that's what it looks like in a little more detail. Um, in this case, we did have somewhat bigger chip than we were used to in prior work. We have a four by four array of sensors. We have a couple of extra sensors in there for calibration to temperature, for cancellation of temperature offsets. Um, and we have an I2C um, interface down here. We kept it away from our analog sensing. Our, the, the place where we're actually doing, you'll see some videos of this coming on. Um, the place where we actually do the sensing is on an interdigitated electrode that looks like that. Okay, so now I wanna show you some, the results of some experiments. Most of the experiments that I'll show you today are for ovarian cancer cells. Um, and that's pretty much all you need to know here, except that um, there's a, technical barrier that we faced for many, many years, which was that when we did this, we could do the experiment, but we couldn't see what was going on. We could not image, because most imaging for these kinds of systems in microbiology is a through, is a through uh, an op the optical path is through the substrate, so they rely on having an optically transparent substrate. We have never had that luxury. And so it's been, so we have eventually, finally developed a system where we can actually get real video imaging of our, sub, of our um, devices. 
Okay, so early on we would get these beautiful, there's a lot of richness in those traces, there's a, obviously a lot going on, but we can't really tell what it is. <laughs> okay, we can say, oh yeah, maybe the cells are growing. I mean, and in some cases we can directly say, yes, the cells are growing. Um, we can do a calibration from that kind of image, time-lapse image, right? You literally, you're growing the stuff in an incubator, you take it out, you take a picture, okay? And then you put it back in the incubator so it stays nice and warm and keeps growing, and then you take it out again to take another picture, <laughs> okay? And those were those two 12-hour separated pictures here, okay? Um, and from that kind of work, you can literally go in and count the number of cells on an electrode and do this calibration to say, okay, well, we are seeing approximately 100 atafarids per cell as it couples to the electrode, okay? But now we have video, okay? And the video is, we should have video, the video is much more compelling, right? Here's, here's okay, so you see we have yellow, black, blue, red. Okay, these are the traces over here. So as the cells are going on, right, so now you, you should notice that yellow and blue don't really have a lot going on, okay? That's going to change soon, but there's a lot more cells on red and black, right? You can literally directly see direct correlation, a direct correlation between cells being on an electrode and healthy and coupled to the surface and the, and the, and the capacitance signal that you, that you measure, okay? I want to back this up. There's something that I want to show you. Okay, so if I do that. Okay, so focus on this black electrode. Okay, on this black electrode, if I back it up a little bit, I'll show you that there's some very detailed um, aspects of the cell behavior that you can now measure. If I back this up a little bit, you can see that on around here, there's a cell. Where's my, no. How do I get the, hmm, I'm, uh, Okay, I can show, it's on another slide, it's on a later slide anyway. Okay, so what I was going to show you, if I could get this video to back up, is that this particular event is actually a, cell, a mitosis event. It's the cell is ready, it's on that electrode, and then this little dip in the capacitance trace is a cell releasing from the substrate, popping apart into two daughter cells, and then coming back down to the substrate. Okay, so we can start to see these very specific um, um, cellular events and see their capacitance images, okay? Um, so what we did relatively recently was post an open access data set. So I just had this fantastic graduate student who finished, who did all this work. He's ne he just went off to work at Intel. Um, but before he left, I made him post all of his data. So we now have this open access data set on IEEE Dataport. Go and like, you know, you have the videos, the real-time videos, you have the capacitance traces. I've got an undergrad in my lab who wants to go and you know, throw neural networks at the problem. <laughs> um, I'd love it if other people would go and do whatever signal processing they want. This is a pretty rich data set. Okay, um, here are some, you know, here's some time slices from this data set. You can see, for example, here, you start to have some cells coupling on the black and red, but nothing's happening on the yellow and blue, and that's a consistent story throughout this data. Um, I'm running out of time, I'll be happy to show you this in more detail, but what we can now do is have direct correlation between the cellular behavior and a capacitance image, and there is very strong direct correlation. Um, we've also done this for looking at, for example, we have two different cancer cell lines, one is sensitive and another is resistant to a particular chemotherapeutic agent, and we can then do titration studies for that chemotherapeutic agent. What was shocking to me when we did this work was that if you don't put it in, right, they both grow fine, no problem. When you start to put it in, the one that is sensitive starts dying right away, okay? But if you put just a little bit more in, the one that's not sensitive, that's resistant, dies too. So you've got this very, very narrow therapeutic window where you can actually have treatment for these kinds of drugs, right? Okay, um, so we'll go on. Okay, so this is a kind of a cool example for the different kinds of cellular phenomena that we know directly now that we can see based on this work. We can see cells moving around. We can see cell motility, okay? So we can see cells as they move around and as they pass over the... Over the um, over the points in the array. We can see cell mitosis. You can see there the cells kind of blopping into multiple daughter cells, okay? It goes pop. Um, so we can see cell mitosis events. Um, and we can see cell death, okay? So these are cells as they're kind of dying, they're gasping, death, death, death shrieks, okay? Death spasms. Um, okay, so, um, okay. So that brings us to the end here. 
um, take home messages that the field is maturing. There's actually a lot more there than you perhaps knew about at the beginning of the talk, hopefully. Um, it's always a good talk if you can learn something, right? <laughs> um, that it, this is very, it's a field that requires significant integration of very heterogeneous technologies. There are a lot of technical challenges, but also it presents very new and unique sensing opportunities. Um, and one of the take home messages that we've found in this field is that it really looks, works a lot better if you apply a systems engineering kind of um, framework and you're thinking in terms of overall end-to-end -end use, and to the extent that you can, you make it easy to use, and you go ahead and incorporate those digital interfaces. It really leverage, it really makes the work much more feasible to accomplish. I'm not sure that we would have gotten to this point, right? We did that digital interface just so that, you know, the people we were working, you know, our stupid collaborators who couldn't work with our sensitive analog chips could actually get our chips to work, right? They weren't stupid. It's just practical laboratory constraints. And so, they help us too. <laughs> Those practical laboratory issues, like I'm not sure we would be showing you this video if we hadn't actually, a couple years before that, put on the digital interface. So having everything streamlined and thinking about making it e easy to use and including the digital <laughs> interfaces is really quite important. Okay, I've shown you some work with nose on a chip. I've shown you some work with a cell viability sensor. And for both of these, we have some, um, you know, we're, these, are, these are both continuing, um, continuing active projects, and I think that there are emerging diagnostic and therapeutic applications for them. Um, and I think that I'll be happy to take your questions. I'd like to say thanks for bringing me here. Um, if anyone has any interest in the area, I'm happy to talk about it more, share some more details. Um, I have some very strong collaborators at Maryland that I've worked with over time, as well as some international collaborators. And I'd like to thank the students who've contributed directly to the results that I showed you in this talk. Um, one student's still working on it. And um, thanks for bringing me here. I had a great time jogging in, uh, what's it called, Forest Hill Park this morning? Okay. Forest Park. <laughs> there was a, there's some sort of a, an air balloon race today. <laughs> they were putting them up this morning. Okay. So questions? So, so the goal for the second part of the study is avoiding cancer cells, right? Mm -hmm. So just to quantify cells, the different parts of, uh, the different aspects of cell utility, cell viability, and proliferation, or is it beyond that? Um, and how sensitive is it dependent on the extra medium substrates, how you handle them, and those kinds of things, which are extraneous to what you see in vivo that may actually Sure, sure. So mostly those, okay, so I'll take the, the first question first. Um, the original idea was to just be able to develop a more automated technique for quantifying aspects of cell health or cell biology, right? We want to understand, so we've worked with collaborators who, were, who wanted to use this for monitoring and, and assessing nanoparticle toxicity. So, so generally for kind of pharmaceutical drug studies, um, we never had this capability to directly see what was happening over long periods of time on the individual sensing sites until relatively recently. Now I'm think honestly, I'm thinking about this and we're patenting this now. Uh, this is a mitotic figure sensor, right? You put cells on here, you can actually measure those mitotic figures. This has very significant advantages. So how do you currently assess cell viability? You currently assess cell viability by putting your cultures in a 96 well plate, by letting them grow, by maybe stopping that, you know, taking, you can, you can in some, in some, in some, for some kinds of assays, you can do measurements over time. But generally, mostly, when you're doing a cell viability assay, it's an endpoint assay. Most cell viability assays are endpoint assays. So you get one time point. So there is no way that you can do this temporal correlation and understand a detailed picture of what's going on with a cell over time, right? What I'm, I guess the argument that I'm making is that adding in the spatial and temporal richness to the, to the data stream matters. And all, of, all existing methods don't have the spatial density or the temporal density. And so this enormously changes that 
landscape in terms of monitoring cell viability. Because the spatial density you get, I mean, you can measure, you know, you're measuring one spot on a cell plate, right? So it's, I guess, I guess you could image. So you could put that in a microscope and image it, but fine. You're, you're still, you're, okay, so maybe, maybe, but the temporal density is really, um, most cell viability assays are endpoint assays. And so ha being able to have the, the, the temporal correlation and understanding over time, I think, is quite important and rich. Okay, so that was the first part of your question. The second part of your question was, but this depends on a lot of stuff. Yeah, it depends on a lot of stuff. It depends on temperature. It depends on the medium. You can see shifts in the capacitance because this, what we're really doing, what the cells are essentially behaving as are, the cells are modulating the dielectric index, right? The cells in this sensor are dielectric index stimuli, right? So really the cells are changing the dielectric index um, environment of the sensors and that's what you're detecting. So I did say something that was a little bit flippant earlier. I said healthy cells adhere strongly, present high capacitance. Unhealthy cells adhere weakly, present low capacitance. Whether the capacitance is high or low depends on the dielectric medium that you're displacing. <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, conceptually, strong coupling or weak coupling, but whether you measure that directly as a high or low capacitance shift depends on the dielectric. And so what we actually do, if I back up to my array again, and you're gonna test me because I think that, okay, I think that that's an extra, that's our extra. We've got a, we've got a couple of extra sensors sprinkled in here. You see these extra sensors that aren't part of those cell that aren't presenting the, di the, the, the interdigitated electrode. Um, and we've got another one over here in the periphery so that we can make sure it's in the packaging and it's really away from the cells. We use those for calibrating shifts. And so you can calibrate the medium shift and the temperature shift from that. I think more of a screen to us, but can you take it from in vitro? It's now, right, right now it's in vitro. Right? It's in vitro. Could you do it in vivo? I, would, I, I actually think that there's a huge possibility for doing this in vivo. Um, we, right now these systems are essentially microcontroller peripherals. In order to do that, we'd have to have the whole shebang because you have to have a way for communication. And we haven't done that yet. Um, we, we've thought about it. Um, it's, it's also like the, one of the original applications for this work was what we were calling the cancer box. You know, in a lot of cases, when you have a, a primary cancer identified, the first step of treatment is surgery to explant the tumor. You could take a little bit of that tumor, stick it on something like this, stick it back in someone's body, and then monitor how their body responds to subsequent treatment, right? Is the cancer dying or is it staying there? Um, the truth is that tumors are really, really complicated, and so we haven't gotten very far with that. Not, we haven't really tried because, I think just because there's so much skepticism because tumors are so complicated. We've done some basic, we've done biocompatibility studies. The basic um, technical leap now would just be to establish the, the communication, and then, we, then you could do this in vivo. I, I mean, there's nothing here in terms of power or size that would restrict you from being in vivo. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, no, we've, we've thought about, we've thought, so, and in fact, different foundries use different kinds of passivation, so you do have to be aware of what you're getting from what foundry you're working with. Um, I, I like to work with the foundries more that use the oxynitride, you know, ox, because I think that, like, for example, IBM uses goo, like this polymer goo encapsulant, and it's thicker, and you don't know, you like, so I think it's just much better to work with the oxynitride type encapsulation, or passivation over top. Um, the, oh, the thickness? Um, we don't really have much control over it. Um, I've thought about doing some, you know, it's, it's just really tricky to put your chips and try to, try to, there, there's some people who have, um, 
eaten away that top passivation. There's some famous examples of that in, in this literature. And it's just really tricky and you need a whole bunch, you're gonna have a whole bunch of failures when you do that. Um, so if you could control that dielectric to be very thin, and um, then there are some additional sensing opportunities that you get. So for example, one of the things that we want to do now in the near future is to try to use this for, um, for uh, kind of binding assays, right? You could, you could literally use this as a DNA spotter, right, if you had the sensitivity. It would probably work better for DNA spotting if that, if that passivation were thinner. So help, if you can help me figure out how to get to a thinner passivation, then there's a lot more applications that we can go after. That's just really technically challenging. Yeah. Yeah.